All right. Welcome, friends, to another episode of the Vital Point podcast. I'm your host, Jonathan Schechter, and I'm so grateful and honored to welcome back today's uh, guest for a second uh, conversation. Her name is Acacia Lewis. And ordinarily, sometimes I have like a, a little bio that I read off of um, for the description of the guest, but Today's guest is really a multi-dimensional, multi-faceted, um, just incredible spiritual person being um, and someone that I'm really honored to talk to and, and consider a friend. So Acacia is an anthropologist, a mycologist, a healer, um, a keynote speaker of definite note in, within the psychedelic community. Um, and just, uh, from what I've gotten to know of her, just an explorer, um, and, a really wonderful, um, outlook on life. You know, I really enjoy our conversations, even when we're not on the podcast together, just texting with her is, is a, is an honor, is a joy. And I feel like I come away with so much just, um, just listening to her. She has a lot of wisdom. And the first conversation that we had for the podcast was one of the most popular. And I, that's no surprise to me. It was so interesting. We talked about uh, Quetzalcoatl and um, the Mazatec lineage of uh, psychedelic mushrooms and uh, so much more. Like if you haven't listened to that episode, go back after you listen to this one. I'm sure you won't even need to be coaxed because you'll be like, wow, I want to, I want to know more about, uh, Acacia and, and her story. So, um, Acacia, anything you wanted to add to that? <laughs> <laughs> no, I think you just about <laughs> covered all bases. Thank you. Um, hi, I'm Acacia awesome. Lewis and you're listening to the vital point season five. Thanks for having me. Jonathan. <laughs> so. Yeah, it's my honor. Thank you. Yeah. So, um, so tell us like what, what you've been up to lately? Like, I know you're into so many different things and uh, I saw, you know, like I was really interested in your, you, you went to back to Mexico and were was doing some, some exploration there of these different ancient sites. Um, Mm -hmm. and then now you've been getting into some, some Buddhist, uh, some journeys there, like really interested to hear about any of that. Ooh, wow. Well, you've touched on a lot, and uh, I'm not sure how much time we have today. So, yeah, let's just start start by, uh, I, I could tell you a little bit about my journey back, uh, back home, uh, back going to Mexico. Um, I, I decided that it would be a good time to go and uh, go check on everybody, go check on my house, go check on my vehicle, etc., But my primary mission in Oaxaca, Mexico, is to study the psilocybin zapotecorum, uh, generally by consuming it. Um, I was introduced to the city of San Jose del Pacifico by Baba Kalindi Iyi, one of my good friends and uh, someone I consider to be a teacher to me. Um, he, uh, He took us there in 2018 for Food of the Gods, and I looked at him and I said, you know, I'm gonna live here. Um, <laughs> mm. I, I basically wanted to stay and never go back to the United States. So every year since 2018, I've been spending the majority of my time uh, between both borders, uh, mainly in San Jose del Pacifico, Oaxaca, uh, in the cloud forest where the Zapotec Horum mushroom and Hoogshagany mushroom and uh, variations of Semper Viva, um, which are strong varieties of psilocybin mushroom that grow in the cloud forest on landslides and potentially in the forest environment. Now, this trip was really important for me because after three years of staying and studying with the Zapotec descendants and some of the indigenous Mexicano people there, uh, I got an amazing opportunity for, as the first time, instead of being treated more as a visitor, being treated as family that was very much missed they allowed me uh, to go to some of the sacred places where the mushroom grows and harvest my own for the first time. And that was the pinnacle of my enjoyment. 
um, because, you know, for three years, you know, I've been studying, okay, the mushroom has been over harvested. If I were to harvest it, how would I harvest the mushroom? How would I talk to some of the people who pick the mushroom? Would I talk about the life cycle? Would I tap the cap, make sure that I'm not picking something that has a closed cap? Um, when you go to the actual environment where the mushroom grows, the people who live there live three to four hours from a, a larger major city. And there, there are several picking locations, but I went to the most remote. So, you know, uh, this, this segues, this crosses over. I'm at a crossroads because I want to talk about several different things that overlap. You know, uh, in an imperial dynasty, in the Tang dynasty in ancient China, the Song dynasties, if you pissed off the emperor, he would send you to the remote areas of the mountains, the high mountain range in China, in the Wuyi Mountains. And this is where people who would go who pissed off the emperor. I learned this from my friend, uh, Mr. John, <laughs> at Sophie's Tea Shop. He's a, a, a lecturer on tea culture and tea history and chemistry. And um, I kind of see him as, as an expert aficionado um, in the field. And he was talking about how the emperors of China would send people who would write satirical comments or uh, political affiliated comments to the high ranges. You know, just don't stay here if you want to do satire. We won't kill you, but we're going to do the mountain. And so that's where all the Confucian philosophers and Taoist philosophers and Teaist philosophers, as well as Buddhist philosophers, all met up as the Wuyi Mountains and some other remote regions in China that were filled with two things, clouds and mist. And that also happens to be one of my favorite uh, Wulong tea uh, varieties. Um, or actually, that one's actually a green tea variety, excuse me, clouds and mist, because it captures the essence of the inspiration that comes from living at high altitude above the clouds. And some of the mushroom varieties that are there uh, have this symbiotic relationship with other plants that grow in those areas. So when you're in Southern Oaxaca, it's almost like being at um, the, the, the equivalent of the Wudang or Wuyi mountain range in China. You feel the same sort of energy of uh, wisdom and it's like uh, old men walking with a large cane hundreds of miles on their own, you know, up these mountain roads with big long beards looking like Lao Tzu and long eyebrows. And they're just like, you know, keeping on, keeping on. They're like 70 years old, 100 years old. And uh, there's one brother, Daddy. If you've ever really lived in the mountain in Oaxaca, Mexico, you've met uh, Brother Dally. He's, uh, he's an elder who eats uh, fresh turtle eggs raw for breakfast every day. And he's convinced that because the turtle has this longevity, uh, he's going to live a really long time by eating these turtle eggs. He looks great for his age. Um, he's well over age 65. He's still walking a mile. And... Um, you know, he's an inspiration to me. I got the honor of getting him some mushrooms from uh, the, uh, the the restaurant slash tea shop uh, where you get the mushroom tea from uh, the elders there in Oaxaca, Mexico. Um, big love to Mama Orfelia and Tio Leonardo who own the restaurant Pacifico. That's where Baba Kalindi took us for our first mushroom tea experience and bufo experience. And they've been my heart in Mexico for a very long time. So that is the area that I was in. So just to give you a full picture, clouds, mist, rolling, shooting cliffs, you know, you're, you're, you're able to see through a keyhole, the Pacific Ocean on really clear days over the clouds. And it's just this majestic space. And so I go there, you know, for solitude. I go there for study. And I feel that, you know, as a lecturer in psychedelic research, people hear mushroom, 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 but they don't understand this is a lifetime of practice and solitude, practice and solitude. And there's no way that I could continue eating mushrooms without that practice and solitude. And so that's been a part of my uh, driving force towards healing this entire time. And so when I say this entire time, what's this entire time mean? Um, since I started working with the mushroom when I was a teenager, I've gone through many different spiritual phases. As a matter of fact, I was just looking around 
uh, my bookshelf and I went to Ikea and I got some frames. And I was like, well, what am I going to frame? I'm going to frame my, uh, my initiatory certificate from the Hare Krishna ashram. Am I going to frame my Native American Church of Turtle Island facilitator license? Am I going to frame, like, I've got all of these initiations and certificates now. And I'm like, okay, well, this is basically just to prove to folks that this has been legitimately my entire life's journey, but I really don't pull them out or talk about these different spiritual phases that I've gone through. And none of them have been temporary phases. Sometimes I'll stop one temporarily and I'll rest and then I'll pick up another one that parallels it and understand a different area. Like for instance, you know, when I first got into Hinduism, I really didn't understand non-dual aspects of divinity. It took me going into Ifa Orisha uh, studies, studying the nine Orishas or uh, nature divinities or ancestors in Africa to really come back to Hinduism and not view it as a polytheistic religion. Monistic religions weren't in my understanding because I was still carrying a lot of Christian fundamental programming that God is separate and that if there's two names of God, they're two separate gods and we're worshiping two different entities. It's not connected to the same entity. So it took me uh, going out of one system and then coming back into it with new knowledge that was still relating to the original system. And for me, what's so profound about the mushroom is that it being, you know, millions and millions and millions of years old. And the human race being only a fraction of a couple million years old in comparison on this rock. And in this time, really only us being able to trace some of the first real artifacts a couple hundred thousand years, you know, since humans were blown off this rock at the last catastrophe. We can find supposed footprints that are 1.5 million years old, etc. But, you know, what's incredible to me is that uh, during the last ice age, the last warm up just ended for the northern craton 11,700 years ago. So, you know, nor we have Europe, etc., under a heist, and then we have in Africa at the same time people in caves making cow shaped effigies and, you know, doing sacred geometry on rocks in Blombo's cave that's 100,000 years old with art sets and ochre paint, you know, uh, and Tesla Plateau is 5,000 years old, which is a lot newer, but we have entire mushroom head statues, etc. Uh, not statues, but mushroom head paintings, you know, that's where you get the, the bee shaman from. And, uh, the Tesla Plateau mushroom headed beings that have boots on and skirts and all sorts of things. So we have to keep in mind that uh, mushroom use is not simply uh, available with the advent of domestication of cattle there were proto cattle before before there were what we think of as cows now there were much larger poop producing beings <laughs> that would have created a perfect and ideal sort of substrate for these um for these mushrooms that are dung loving or growing on poop psilocybin mushrooms and the early buddhist uh, priesthood and the early Buddhist monks knew this. As a matter of fact, Buddhism was was first started by a man named Padmasambhava, uh, who converted the Bon people of Tibet, who were an indigenous culture who worked with shamanic plants and fungi. And he didn't really take add too much. He really just brought them all together and united them under one cultural religion, Buddhism. And he even converted the mountain demons, it's said in the ancient texts, uh, into Dharma protectors and negotiated and tamed certain demons and turned them for good to work for the benefit of liberating all beings from suffering. And so when I read books like Mike Crowley's uh, Secret Drugs of Buddhism, I have it somewhere around here <laughs> it's in, my, in my space, when I read that book, I am immediately captured by the fact that even in Africa, the Oshun 
and Olu are words for the mushroom. And if you know anything about African spirituality, Oshun is a goddess of love, you know, and milk and honey and fertility and the river and water. And the mushroom is 90% water, you know? And so the mushroom, even in Africa, most of the cultures in Africa, even in the Ivory Coast, the mushroom is called the mushroom of knowledge, the psilocybin mushroom or the conocybe mushroom, because there are plu uh, plutuous, plu 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 plutus, or plutes as they call them, conocybes, psilocybes, panelius. We talk about psilocybin mushrooms a lot, but there's a lot of psilocybin containing mushrooms that don't have the word psilocybin in the name. And the conocybe mushroom is one that's used in Africa traditionally in the Ivory Coast. If you look up uh, an article from Suleiman, uh, Medicine Journey, 1995, Paris, France, you'll find many different articles about a man's expedition to a healer in the Ivory Coast who used the mushroom of immortality and the mushroom of knowledge to heal his patients by allowing them to deal and contend with or fight with their spiritual double in their dreams and then come out healed the next day. So you would get sick. The, the healer would say, okay, you're going to get sick and you're going to eat these mushrooms and you're going to want to go to sleep. And after you go to sleep, you're going to wake up and you're going to get well. And that's just a lot simpler than how Westerners view it. Oh, you got to have the set and setting. Ah, oh, you know, you got to stay up all night. Ah, oh, you got to sit in the lotus pose. You got to do this, that, and the third. You don't want to fall asleep. And what's ironic to me is that <laughs> Many other cultures don't place so much importance on the concept of ego that Westerners do. And Westerners really only do that because of Freudian concepts that were introduced long after the mushroom was utilized. And I think we have to be very cautious when we try to fit a several hundred million year old entheogen into a 400 or 500 year old philosophical concept. Because that philosophical concept is far too immature to contain the vast amounts of knowledge and uh, uh, historical context that the mushroom is able to hold and dispel as knowledge to a seeker or an initiate. There's no way that we can simply uh, uh, under explain and oversimplify the concept of our spirituality to a unconscious, a superconscious, and an I, an ego. Because in different traditions, if you look around Africa, we have the Ori. And the Ori is the, the higher self or the throne of your power. You'll see little hats that have seats on them and a little guy sitting in the seat. What's on your head? And we have different deities that are installed into your head, literally. Different spirits that are programmed into your divine presence so that now as you become a priest of Ogun, Ogun comes through your body, this very powerful spirit that is healing and nurturing and a warrior and has all of these qualities. And in Tibetan Buddhism, we see the same type of behaviors when we talk about Devada Yoga or Vajra, uh, Vajrayana Buddhism, which is all coming out of a psychedelic con context of we have thousands of deities none of which are real, they're all created in the mind, but they have very real qualities. And these qualities can be developed through meditation, speaking the mantra, and combination with Amrit. And Amrit right now, like the saffron water I just drank a couple of days ago for my first initiation, um, are all entheogenic plants. Saffron being a, an actogen, very much like MDMA, containing MDA. And I don't care what anyone says, uh, a little bit of saffron water in your hand when paired with the words of power, when paired with the positive intention, when paired with the right prayers can be stronger uh, as a psychedelic than a 20 or 30 gram mushroom trip. Because you are completely present in the moment, you're not thinking about yourself, you're listening to the transmission of the ultimate truth from an honored teacher or a beloved and respected teacher. And that's something that's missing from the mushroom experience. And when you combine any of those aspects with the mushroom experience, it changes the dosage. You have people who listen to honored and revered teachers under the influence of the psilocybin mushroom, 
and their experiences are ridiculously strong at low dose. And they look at people who are taking 20 and 30 grams, like, what are you trying to run away from? Have you just gotten so far from the truth that you need 20 or 30 grams to break through and have a significant spiritual experience? I'm having a spiritual experience on the dust that fits in the palm of my hand, you know? And so there's this gap, there's this gap of communication between people who are practice and study heavy who are having psychedelic experiences from birth without the use of psychedelics people who are using psychedelics without study and practice and spiritually their whole experience is wrapped up in the psychedelic experience and then people who are doing a little bit of both and there are people who say they haven't had spiritual experiences because they don't separate the term reality from spiritual everything spiritual even though they seem very much like atheists, some of those people are the most spiritual people I've ever met because they're living life completely in the present, not thinking about what's going to happen when they die. And because they're in that state, they're automatically into a higher, higher spiritual realization than a lot of people who are studying these systems. And it's ridiculous. You know, it's, it's, it's beautiful. It's diverse. Mm. Yeah. But it's not what you'd expect, you know? And so my my passion, Acacia's passion is researching and then speaking with people from all walks of life to be able to find that that common point, that zenith, that zenith of understanding, that fixed point where you can look at all cultures, all walks of life and say, okay, we're all human and we're all also this. We're also an awareness. We also have a perception and that perception is perceived a million and one different ways, but there's a point of source. There's a perspective that everybody's trying to get to, whether you're an Ifa Risha an Obatala, or if you're a Buddhist uh, priest and you're you're, you're working towards your path or journey towards enlightenment, uh, or whether you are a Hindu uh, 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 devotee and you want to become a Vaishnav and remember the pastimes of Krishna and the gopis and the gopadas, or, or whether you're an atheist and you really just want to live life in the moment and accept things as they are with no explanation, no desires, no purpose, just being. There's a commonality in all of those things. And, uh, you know, when I was in college, I, I used to think of, I had a theory, you know, I had a friend in college. He were still friends. We still talk. His name's Jacob. And, you know, I, I had this crazy theory in college that all spiritual systems and all religions are like a diamond. And there's a top, there's a plateau to that diamond that we look at when we see like the people wearing their priestly garb and the initiates, um, you know, and uh, here, give me one second. All right, here we go. But I was saying that there's some, there's some initiates, like once they get to the point where you're, you're the priest, you're the Dharma practitioner, you're the beloved teacher, there's that plateau and then there's, what's directly under that plateau, which is the source of where all of that divine information came from. There's this inspiration that's connected to the human experience and the spiritual experience, whether you're Christian or Muslim or Islamic, whether you call God Allah, or if you call God Vajra Yogini, whatever it is that you are connected to, there's a commonality in that. And I wanted to see if we could get physicists who are studying quantum states to also work with theologians from all different walks and backgrounds to try and uh, 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 settle the quantum debate of the nature of our reality. Because I strongly feel that quantum particles are simply uh, super highly densely information packed uh, sentient um, beings. And if you read the sutras very carefully, you'll find different excerpts to back that up. 
being billions of Buddhas inside of a mode of dust, if you will, or 144,000th of a molecule being that which is the personality of the Supreme Godhead. The smaller and smaller you get, the closer and closer you get, that there's something there that is projecting light or information into this reality. And we're all trying to communicate with it because when you do, miracles take place. And that's what I like to study. Yeah, there's like so many different things that I want to touch on there. Um, but what's immediately coming up for me is the um, one of my teachers explained it as the like looking at a prism, you know, like the the white light comes into the prism and then shoots out as the different colors of the mm -hmm. rainbow. And those are all the different manifestations, the different animations of the different deities, the mm -hmm. different Buddhas. So just like you're saying, you know, there's there, there being one source and yet this myriad, almost this infinite number based on the complexity of people and their cultures mm -hmm. and their um, their religious beliefs, their the terrain that they grew up in, the energy and spirits in that, um, you know, in that area and through connected to their familial cultures, their geneal genealogical timelines. Um, to create this, you know, vast number of different emanations. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I had an experience like that living with my grandfather when I was first, you know, the first few years that I was really studying Buddhism. And I, I felt like um, at that time, like I really felt like I had, um, I had like a superiority complex, like, oh, Buddhism is better and more evolved than the you know Judea judaism that i grew mm -hmm. up in and my grandfather was like a devout catholic and so in the beginning like i was kind of looking at him <laughs> and i'm sure he was looking at me like like and we started to have these dialogues mm -hmm. and where like i i was able to like put that feeling of superiority aside and just be curious and a lot of the things that he would tell me about Catholicism, it made sense to me within the context of the Tibetan Buddhism that I was, you know, learning about. Um, like he would tell me about these different emanations and different um, appearances of the, the, the Virgin in these different places at the same time and how like these, you know, these documented miracles. And whereas maybe... A few years before that, I would have been like, well, I'm not a Catholic, so I don't believe that, you know, like in that moment, I was able to say like, oh, this is exactly like what I'm when I go to my Dharma study and they talk about the em different emanations of Tara, you know, like and that they, that the Buddhas can be in the same place, at, you know, different places at the same time and have these different emanations. It all kind of it's it all makes sense it's just looking at the same thing in in a different way and so like that was a really humbling experience for me to get that different perspective like just to to see somebody else somebody with really strong beliefs and really like centered in their spiritual being but in a way where i would have not been curious before you know like it would have been like Oh well, you're Catholic, and I don't believe in that. So, what do I have to learn from you? Yeah, I want to speak to something to that because I think we all go through that, coming from wherever we landed and whatever uh, system we found ourselves uh, being pushed towards or told that this is the right way, you know. And for me, I really had to heal my relationship with other people and understand individual. Uh, spiritual re realizations have value and uh, appreciate people's perspective on an individual level rather than a religion level because my mother is a Christian and my mother prays a lot but her prayer is not everybody else's prayer just like if you're a Buddhist monk and, and you're doing a mantra for Vajrayogini and doing one for Manjushri 
her her prayers were very intricate and profound and she she woke me up at three or four in the morning praying for hours on new Year's. she'd pray all night long you know all the way through the night i always think that she was kind of weird or something for doing that and then as i've grown in my own spiritual practice i have a deep admiration and reverence for her spiritual practice and you know <laughs> with the mushroom the thing that really gets me me going is the fact that in the bible you have manna and a lot of people discuss that manna may be a hallucinogen i believe that it's ergo that's why i think that's what my gut says i don't have uh, uh the, the proof to back it up but there's some there's some folks on youtube who believe the same thing and they got more proof than i do so you can look that up but I do truly feel that it's not when you renounce the world and you renounce and say, my belief's better than your relief belief that you start making progress. It's when you start uh, allowing the spirit of kindness and compassion to move through you in such a way that you start profoundly affecting your environment and those around you. And rather than renouncing the world, you start improving your environment as a friend of the deities, as a technician of the sacred, if you will, as a servant of the divine and the servant of the servant and those that you speak to and those that you interact with. And it's not just casually saying, oh, I'm not going to get into politics or, oh, no, I'm not going to talk about this with so-and-so. Or, oh, I see that there's something wrong and I'm not going to say anything. It's going into prayer and being active in your prayer, being active in your ability to make changes through source to your reality. And the collective unconscious waking up and saying, wait, we have a say as well. But you have to be moving in righteousness and in goodness towards towards healing yourself you know you can you can go the other direction but there's going to be consequences to that that you might not like so much if you decide that you're just going to dedicate yourself to um activities that are less than wholesome you know to destroying your environment and whatnot a lot of people will wake up and then say oh well if god created everything then i'm lucifer and i'm the devil too and i'm Mara or whatever, the great confuser. And I look at them and I'm like, okay, like spirituality does not have to be good or bad. It doesn't have to be, you don't have to choose duality inside of your spiritual system. Because I feel that, you know, just like Pavis and Pava converted the demons into Dharma protectors, so such can we take these darker activities and put them to good use. Like, you know, when I was first working with the mushroom, I came up against my my rage and my anger. And I had to make a decision to not kick out my rage and anger, but to create a conduit that was righteous anger out of it. So I wasn't lashing out about stupid stuff and using my energy for the wrong reasons. I was saving that energy uh, so that I could use it to protect others and to fight against forces that were actually destroying things. You know, and that's like taming your own demons and feeding your own demons uh, so that they can then propel you towards your destiny in a sacred way. You know, um, I feel like that's why practice is so important, because so many people will take the mushroom, have a firsthand experience with their own divinity. But they stop there and say, I'm a god this, I'm a goddess this, I'm a this, you're a this, they're muggles. And they start defining these boundaries and they make this mandala of samsara, which is a grief mandala, basically, you know, and when I say mandala or Buddha field here, just imagine that you, you're, you're on Webkins or on Farmville. And now you've decided that you're going to start, you've got your own little castle of I'm a god, I'm a goddess, my god does this and it has this powers and these abilities and everybody else around me is lesser than me or if they don't look this way like my character, then they're not good enough. 
And I, I was in that mode of realization until eventually all the walls had to come tumbling down that I created of this person's less this or this person's more this. And I realized that from my fixed focal point, anybody that I was looking at was reflecting back to me whatever I was putting out or pouring out. So however lost I thought someone was at a time was exactly how lost I was in my perspective of the, the reflection I was receiving back. I think that the mushroom puts you in a different position at, uh, of awareness. You, you can expand your awareness and expand your focus or you can narrow your awareness and narrow your focus. And both have utilizations. Some people go one direction and then all of a sudden turn around and go the other direction and zoom way far out. And you're like, whoa, man, I don't know where you're at, but they're like, you know, I am Jesus now. I died for your sins. Worship me. And then go completely left if you don't honor their newfound spiritual identity. And there are people who actually go uh, into asceticism and go live in a cave for the rest of their life and humble themselves to the point that they end up starving to death because they thought that that was the way, you know, and there's no wrong or right way, but there's definitely ways where you can go through a lot less suffering, you know, and personally, that's why, that's why I'm attracted to the middle way. That's why I'm attracted to um, practice solitude and psychedelic use because I feel that you can get lost in the practice just like you can get lost in psychedelic use. You can start judging people again and thinking that you've got it figured out and that everybody, you know, you start putting those walls up and dividing yourself from yourself essentially. And you start creating this echo chamber of you got only your Facebook friends, only the people that you talk to that echo what you want to hear. And then when you come up against somebody who gives you the slightest bit of resistance, you're like, oh, that guy was an asshole. You know, I can't believe that he said such and such and such, you know, and I found that when we are strong enough to accept others for who they are on an individual level and challenge ourselves to be empathetic to whatever situation that they're in, we put ourselves not in the position of authority, but we put ourselves in the position of the servant to ourselves. And because of that, other people want to help us because that's the reflection that they then show because we've taken ourselves off of that pedestal of enlightenment and lowered ourselves to a point that now we, we're attracting all of the help that we need and also helping those as a result because all we want to do is help others. And what Mike Crowley said at his lecture was in his book, Psychedelic Buddhism, he lays out that people should really start with the Hinayana tradition first for a year. Stay pretty, you know, uh, ascetic. Don't do any psychedelic drugs and just study, you know, and, and do your meditation practice and really ground deeply, you know, into your first empowerment or your second empowerment, and then progress to the Mahayana Buddhist uh, 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 system, or then you have enactogens like MDA and MDMA, the saffron water, you know, and uh, then you just dedicate all of that positive energy to serving others. Are you there? Hello? Okay. Yep. The camera went out. Yeah. So. Yeah, I'm here. Um, and once you dedicate okay. yourself to serving others, then you'll go into Vajra, uh, uh, Vajrayana, which is the tantric path where you're actually introduced to the mind of the Buddha, which is inside of your own mind. And then you can actually start working with the psilocybin mushroom in your third year of development. I really like that because I've seen a lot of people, you know, crash into the psilocybin mushroom and, uh, you know, for me, I was doing higher than average doses from the very beginning, and I really enjoyed it. But at the same time, you know, when I first heard Kalindi E talk uh, in my late teens, he was talking about um, the Kala Chakra and the sand mandalas and the Buddhist monks would create and look into and travel into these places of learning and healing and development and that these mantras had special, specialized vibrational tones that that shifted you to different altered states of consciousness and whatnot. That piqued my interest on another level because I noticed that there are a lot of people coming in 
who were eating the mushroom but not really pairing it with any practice so that they could sharpen steel with steel or sharpen iron with iron to be able to carve oneself out of clay, uh, so to speak, through your practice, and then also make yourself usable uh, rather, rather than just being on display as a spiritual person what were you doing for your community? What skill were you honing into? Were you skill were you becoming skillful in herbalism? Were you becoming skillful in medicine work? Were you becoming skillful in, in, in massage or whatever it is that you do? You can utilize the entheogens to perfect uh, and bring out the subtle qualities in your practice. And without that practice, you end up just on the internet talking about mushrooms all day and bufo or whatever the heck that you're doing. And you're just doing stuff to say that you did it. And it lacks that depth and that integral power that comes from uh, being grounded in, in something that is bigger than you, that's in service to others and ultimately going to help somebody else out in the end. It's the daytime work that goes along with the nighttime or secret mm -hmm. work that I don't think people put so much emphasis on, you know? Um, yeah. One of, one of my favorite um, quotes from Padma Sambhava is even though my, even though my, um, <clears throat> even though my vision, even though like my view is as vast as the sky my conduct is as fine as flower, you know? So like, in other words, even though I have this great tantric realization where I, you know, know that I am a Buddha and I am living in this Buddha field, I still act with ethics. I still really watch my conduct because just like you're saying, if we gain this realization that sometimes can come through you know, work working with different entheogens or, or otherwise, um, without that grounding in that we're still human, uh, we still have to you know chop wood and carry water and be a part of our community. Like, but you're even saying, that's becoming a um, buzzword. Then that's where I think people can get like grounded. Yeah, but you know? even that's becoming a oh yeah a sure. I mean, is oh chop wood, carry water. Oh, I'm doing the work. Uh, this is a quote from Pavis and Baba I just pulled up that really resonate with me because even for the people who think they're doing that, um, I feel like they're still fabricating this notion of divinity on some level in their heads. And w there's this quote from Pavis and Baba that, you know, that allows you to kind of see through the fabrication trap. Um, even in Vajrayana Buddhism, when you're when you're working with uh, uh, your empowerment, etc., there are many different forms that this empowerment can take, and you're not self-identifying with that form. Uh, it's a different kind of relationship. And it says, uh, having, it says, uh, you may wonder, is mine nothing? It still shimmers and flashes forth like haze in the heat of the sun. You may wonder, is it something? It has no color or shape to identify it, but it's utterly empty and completely awake. That is the nature of your mind. Having recognized it as such to become certain about it, that's the view. To remain undistracted in the state of stillness without fabrication or fixation, that is the meditation. In that state to be free from clinging or attachment, accepting or rejecting, hope or fear towards any of the experiences of the six senses, that is the conduct. Um, whatever doubt or hesitation occurs, mentally call on your master for help. <laughs> so, you know, that's, that's the quote that I wanted to pull up because for me, I took that into a psychedelic experience and I recognized that there are so many ways that we become hyper suggestible under the influence of psychedelics, mm -hmm. where we trick ourselves into thinking that we are doing something more really than, than, than what is to be done will fixate on these small activities and we'll start basically mentally masturbating about doing the work, you know? And um, I just wanted to, to put it out there that that's, that's something that you can uh, let go of because when you try to milk it for merit, you're really make creating a deficit for yourself. 
And then you feel this attachment to doing these activities, which then ends up in revulsion towards people who do not. And so if you stop fixating and you stop fabricating, you create this vortex and it just kind of opens up all of this creative information that comes through you. And Kalindi would talk about this organic singularity that occurs when the entire community starts accessing uh, this organic intelligence, this infraparticle intelligence purely for what it is, not without a filter, not trying to put it into, you know, a, a freaking container. But when we all start uh, utilizing this, this connection, it's like there's this quantum entanglement between the, uh, the intelligent source or the intelligent spirit inside of all of us, inside of your, your heart, inside of your mind. And when there are a lot of people tapping into it at the same time, um, what the Tibetans call turning of the Dharma wheel can take place where we all start elevating our consciousness on a certain uh, on a certain frequency, and we push forward and simultaneously elevate our vibration to a higher space. And not even just the vibration of this reality, but if you're on under the influence of the mushroom during a time when there's 15 other people also taking the mushroom and going to a certain frequency or place, like Kalindi talked about the interdimensional village, it's a meeting space where we all see each other as we truly are, which are, you know, divine beings. But we're all connected in that one mind, one heart, one, one love. And inside of that space, when there's enough of us who flood into that place and communicate with each other, when we come back to this reality, it's almost as if somebody melted this world and then put it back together differently with uh it, it's like even the walls seem happier you know um the things that happen in our lives and to our loved ones are just profound healing profound uh uh, uh miracles happening some somebody who literally didn't have a place to live finds a house right down the street or somebody who didn't have any money uh who we prayed for in of that in that space or we sent positive energy in that space is is suddenly victorious and 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 wins a hundred dollars or or, or two thousand dollars you know there there are profound things that can happen when a group of people come together and go into those spaces with that practice and with that discipline of not fixating on it not fabricating it but allowing your connection to source to be what it is free from distraction and and uh to communicate it on that wavelength, there's some magic that takes place where organic intelligence or the hive mind of many thousands of beings all sharing a prayer or being in a sangha, if you will, uh, a community that that is able to push forward past our human li limitations and really make real change happen on this planet. And I think that's the, the purpose of world meditation. I think that's the purpose of of a sangha praying to to bring forth the second golden age except when you bring in the psychedelic medicines into it sometimes you can you can get even more work done so how how would you recommend sort of starting on that path because i think one of the things that i just heard you say um you know in, in terms of not fabricating it at least in my my experience with Buddhism, they talk about the the relative bodhicitta and the ultimate bodhicitta. The ultimate bodhicitta being the that your everything that you talked about in terms of your mind and the nature of mind, the nature of reality, you have to start generating um, it. and being able to realize that right. But but starting with the relative being like where you're at and like sort of I don't want to say this cliche of like fake it till you make it, but that's that is sort of a good way to describe it. And you're, you know, you're, you're putting that intention out there into the world. You're starting to say, oh, okay, I'm not going to think just about myself. I'm going to start to think about other people. I'm going to treat other beings as if they were or me, my mother, you know, you know, I'm going to treat them with the same compassion and mm -hmm. can care. Right. So I guess I'm curious how you, what do you think uh, is a good way to get started with that path that's ultimately going to lead to that ultimate realization? Start, 
practicing some form of discipline. It doesn't matter what religion you are for this. You don't have to be studying uh, to generate bodhicitta. You don't have to be a Sufi or a monk or a Hindu devotee to do this. I think that any form of discipline that brings your focus to the current moment is going to eventually help you get there. Because heaven's in that moment. That universal love is in that moment. That other dimension's in that moment. And whether you're an atheist or a Buddhist or whatever, or eating mushrooms, it doesn't really matter. But the closer you get to that in-between space between now and infinity is where that magic takes place. And as you start training yourself closer and closer and closer to that moment, you you form this compassion for others that slows time down little by little to where you can start opening up to other work that needs to be done inside yourself. And I think people can yeah. start doing that by maybe microdosing if, if they feel like they need some help. You know, just put it kind of a matter of factly. It's like you can do meditation and mindfulness and stuff, and it might take you 20 years or you could just go in at high dose. And now I agree and I disagree with that simultaneous because you can have some high level uh, realizations, but without having a prepared container, it's kind of like taking a shower and then sleeping in a garbage pail. You know, if you don't clean out that garbage pail first, it's just going to be kind of uncomfortable going back to the life that you had if you're not trying to already cultivate that focus and discipline that can nurture that realization, you don't want to plant a seed in better soil, you know? Um, but my seed was planted in some nasty ass clay and old, old, old sock smelling substrate. And somehow it germinated and it's doing okay right now, but I had to go through the discomfort of really objectively seeing my life for what it is and instead of trying to run away from it or or negate it and say no i'm this or no i'm that i accepted my bs for my bs and i still accept my bs for my bs i'm not perfect i'm still figuring shit out and ultimately you know being objective without judgment towards who and what you are is some of the best advice i can give anybody don't try to uh, don't try to put yourself in the good box or the bad box just yet. Just be, hmm. you know. Yeah. So yeah, and just just like you're saying, just connecting connecting to that present moment really transcends any sort of labels exactly. or descriptions or and, any ism that you, you want to put on it. And you can do it through tea. You can do it through martial arts. You can do it through reading a book. You can do it through clipping your toenails. You can do it in the shower. You can do it while you're driving. There's no restriction on it. It's, it, it's, 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 it's not a schedule one substance, but it's, it's certainly psychedelic. If mm. you, if you really dedicate yourself to giving it a chance and a lot of people say, well, it can't be that simple. And that's how all of, all of this is, you know, if you're going to say that, then of course right. you're going to make it hard for yourself. <laughs> but, you know, many, many yeah. Buddhist monks, said, I think Thich Nhat Hanh said this, forgive me if I'm wrong, but he said that, that enlightenment is like the eyelashes are, we think it's something that's way, way, way far away, but in a split second, it could be right in front of your face, you know, and you not see it because you're, you're still looking for it elsewhere. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And, and that's, that's the magic of the mushroom or other <laughs> entheogens is they like sort of pull that veil away and give you access to that, that split second mm -hmm. shift. But then like you're saying, it's like being able to bring that back into the rest of your life. And like, how are you bringing that divinity into the rest how of your you life? Practicing? Um, I've yeah. been really interested by, yeah, I've been really interested in like how you, the things you've been sharing about tea ceremonies. And like, you know, you just mentioned that, um, you know, any sort of ritual, any sort of activity yeah. can be elevated to that, that level for me as of, well. you know, of connecting with the divine. You know, ancestor ven veneration for yeah. me was a huge step forward because after my, my teacher died and my wife died, you know, I was left just feeling like completely abandoned in this reality, you know, and that's after having done the practice and being very much immersed in, 
and seeking guidance and having good teachers around even then. And, you know, just putting somebody's picture in a frame, putting a candle next to it and sitting with it. And really just sitting with grief and sitting with loneliness and allowing my mind to connect to that their spirit in my heart and realizing that they're not dead as in gone forever, but merely transformed. Mm -hmm. And that I would have to get better at my shit really to communicate with them if I really wanted them in my life. And that to understand that they could still see me raw, unfettered, um, completely torn apart and still have love for me. It brought me back to this space of, yeah. okay, I can do this. I can still live. I can still go on. I can still practice. It's not all a waste of time, you know, because hmm. when something happens yeah. to you where you question why you've been placed here and if this was all just some kind of sick joke, and if you should really just take your life right now and make the excruciating pain go away, sometimes a picture from a beautiful space can change all of that if you just allow yourself to meditate on it. And sometimes hmm. spirits can reach I've... through and say, hey, I see you. I love you. And that love might be all you need to stop from consuming you. You know? And yeah. Um, yeah. I got to I got to see Thich Nhat Hans teach in person one time. Um, it was an honor, you know. And he spoke about like the the people in our life, you know, our our relatives not being gone because you can look into your hand mm -hmm. and see them. They're 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 literally there, and that they're literally in the palm of your hand. And like, if you, you know, that it's okay to feel grief, like it's okay to, to miss them. But at the same time, you know, it's that duality, right? It's that, it's that, that understanding, like, yes, they might be gone in this form and they're also right well, here. You know, we carry that, them with us at all times. That's also really great for people you're related to, but not so great for people who you're not uh, physically, you know, related to. Um, life partners, you know, even though they're, they're, they are physically imprinted into your DNA. Sometimes, sometimes it, it's, it's nice to be able to allow their, their energy or the signature of their voice to linger on you because that's in your mm. heart, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. I think it's, I think it is in your heart. Like you're, like we were saying at the sort of in the beginning of this talk in terms of the quantum mm -hmm. particles, you know, like I really feel like the, the people that we're around and we spend time with, and especially if we're, if it's more than just having a conversation with somebody on a bus mm -hmm. stop or something, like it's the people that we're intimate with on these different levels, you know, they're changing the quantum state and you carried of, their the DNA particles that are a part too. of us, you know, you, you still, every, yeah, every time absolutely. you share a glass of water, you know, I mean, if you put it that way, of course, but what, what I really meant was, you know, I've spent a lot of time looking at my hands and my arms and stuff on mushrooms. And, you know, I feel like because I am Brown, I didn't, I tend to think more of my Brown skinned ancestors. You know, I don't really think about my, partner as much as being like an ancestor even though she very much is an ancestor now you know now the term ancestor has extended to include anyone who's crossed over um but there are certain ones that um i i feel that the the vibration of a name invokes that quantum spirit when you charge the particles in front of your in front of your face with the vibration of saying their name saying, you know, Kalindi e, Ibayashi, saying Maladi Lewis Ibayashi, giving power to their name and power to who they were to you. I feel like it invokes them back into the space through your mindfulness and um, establishes a deeper connection, you know, um, with them, even outside of like what's physically inside of you, you know? So. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. That's a good reminder for sure. Um, 
Tell me a little bit about your one of your new projects, the 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 peaches. The oh, I've been going peaches. for a Is minute. <laughs> now we're about to get onto moon cakes, you know, so you can go to the moon. <laughs> Um, a lot of people have been asking to go for higher dose confectional creations and we're like, okay, we're about to go to 10, 20 grams of extract so you can eat a lotus paste filled moon, a moon cake with ube. I don't know if you've seen the purple yam, the taro or ube flavor treats, yeah. you know, I might, I might make a few of those, you know, for some of the more daring folks, but yeah, the peaches are going good. You know, it's a recipe that's taken 10 years you know, in the making. For me, I don't just eat mushrooms. I work with traditional Chinese medicine and Ayurveda because I believe that the mushroom has a specific kind of energy that affects your organs like any other food that you eat, whether it's cold, hot, sour, sweet, bitter, astringent. You know, I I look at the mushroom as being categorizable in, inside the five flavors and the five organs. And so since it's kind of sour and a little bit bitter, uh, a tiny bit sweet, you know, it, it's affecting the gut, the liver, and the kidneys. And modern science has proven again and again that even though psilocybin is safe, it does put some stress on your kidneys, you know, as far as if you're going to eat it a lot. You know, I was talking to a guy at the Buddhist Empowerment who's been doing mushrooms uh, his whole life, you know, uh, fresh mushrooms in Bali. And uh, this, is, this is a man who's been following Guru Rinpoche for 50 years, 60 years, he said, I've been following him so long that you were in your last life <laughs> when I started following him. Uh, so that was amazing. And we were talking, he said, yeah, when I first discovered mushrooms, I would eat them every single day for a year until it would just make me physically nauseous. I'm like, well, you're supposed to give it time in between. He's like, I know that now. But at the time, I had just discovered them on the beach, fresh and banana leaves in Bali, and I was just eating them and eating them. And I got really sick. And I, I remember in in uh, Secret Drugs of Buddhism, Mike Crowley's book, he talks about the nettle leaves of Milarepa and how for people who are eating mushrooms, nettle cleans out the livers and makes the, the urine very sweet to the taste. And a lot of gurus would utilize their urine as amrit. They eat the mushroom and then transmute it and the psilocybin would come out in the urine free from toxins because it would convert to psilocin in the liver. So, you know, um, or they eat Amanita muscaria, and just like the shamans in uh, Lake Baikal region in Russia, who eat the Amanita muscaria dried, and uh, and then utilize their urine to give as a sacrament. You know, this is a, a sacred tradition. Nettle, uh, nettle really cleans you out. Um, and it makes it so that you can not have negative side effects from continued use. So when we talk about the immortal golden peaches, um, you know, I, I put in certain things that are known to counteract the negative qualities of the mushroom because it's a yang jing tonic, meaning that it affects your kidneys, it gives you vitality, but in exchange, uh, a lot of the indigestible chitin or spores could clog you up a little bit if you're not careful. And of course, it's just going to stress your system because your body thinks it's poison at first, unless you break it down to psilocin or just chew it all in your mouth and let the sublingual psilocin uh, be carried by honey that you'll eat with it and glucose into your bloodstream directly. And then you just have <laughs> the original Mayan or mixed tech experience that way. But if you're just eating them and swallowing them without lemon or anything, uh, it's best to, to take some nettle tea the day after so you're not having any body aches or whatnot. But the immortal golden peaches are something that's secret. I don't really talk mm. too much in public about them, but they were something that I designed for psychonauts who, like myself, want a pinnacle experience uh, without the body load and also want to uh, expand the awareness and work with wisdom keeping plants, plants that have a certain signature like eucomia that cleans the liver out when you take psilocin and also is known to impart calmness and focus and memory uh, to, to the person who's taking it, as well as strengthening your, your joints and your tendons and uh, your bones. It, it's one of the foremost ingredients in Shaolin uh, uh, did that jiao. And uh, I, Iron Jade Bone 
tonics, you know, and these are things, there's our liniments that you apply to your skin after you've participated in martial arts. But you can also drink the Eucomia tea internally. It's Chinese rubber latex tea. So if you've ever seen the movie The, the Incredibles with Elastic Girl or something, you know, the, the concept of being elastic, you know, also came from some of these plants. You know, and that's why I like tea so much because I feel like Camellia sinensis is the most underrated entheogenic plant medicine in the world because everybody knows about green tea. Everybody's probably heard about it. Everybody's probably drank it, hate it because it tastes like crap to them. And if you go into the history of it, you've got an entire tradition that preceded Buddhism that was a part of the foundational elements of Buddhism that the monks loved to utilize because it imparted the strength and the focus and the ability to enter meditative states of consciousness. And um, they carried it with them into Japan, you know, from China. And so we, we have a, a, a situation where personally, I feel like my tea practice comes even before my psilocybin practice. If I really want to practice my meditation, I'm going to drink some oolong tea that's from the Wee Mountain Range, high mountain oolong that has GABA in it that helps promote the calm and relaxed feeling in my body so that I don't get into the mushroom and have physical jitters. I want to feel good. I don't want to feel like crap. I don't want to eat 20 grams of mushrooms to have my back hurting because my kidneys are all blocked up or have a headache the next day and be hungover. I don't appreciate any of that. I fine tune my practice as much as I possibly can. And that's the only reason I keep doing it. Because if it was the way it was when I started out, I would have quit by now. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> well, th that, um, you know, that brings me back to something I wanted to ask you um, from what you were sharing in the beginning um, about the mushrooms, the, uh, you know, sacred mushrooms from different areas. You know, you, you mentioned in uh, Oaxaca, you mentioned in the Ivory Coast. Do you, do those mushrooms have like yep. different, um, spirit different or different everything. effects than like, say like a cubensis no, mushroom? And, and we really need to stop with these people saying that there's no difference between two different cubensis mushrooms. In one spore print, you've got a thousand different sub varieties that could come out of it. And, you know, in the laboratories, they're finally mm -hmm. testing the psilocybin content of these mushrooms and finding that there are many, many different variations, even from mushroom to mushroom in the same batch of agurisin, of norpsilocin, of baocystin, of uh, NNDMT and 4-PO-DMT and 5-hydroxyl uh, uh, DMT. There, there's so many different compounds that the mushrooms are producing, including cortisol, which is one that a penis envy was found to possess as cortisol and then a penalia species that was found to produce serotonin. We don't know shit about the mushroom. We just think we know something. And the, the closer and closer we get to 2023, 2024, we're going to have smart shops very much like the ones that exist right now uh, for cannabis, where you'll go in and you'll have a menu and you'll look and you'll see this has 2.83% psilocin and then 1.8 percent orally active dot and then we can talk about strains really but i trust kalindi e he he is my absolute favorite psychonaut even beyond the grave i don't care <laughs> because he went to so many different countries and he worked with specific indigenous varieties in every single country he pretty much went to in australia he ate mushrooms in prague he ate the mushroom in the czech republic in the United States, in the Pacific Northwest, in Mexico. And his favorite mushroom was the Zapotecorum mushroom. You can't tell me anything <laughs> because that mushroom has been growing in its most prized and sacred environment for thousands of years, unbroken. And the people there still talk about it. It's not like when you go to Bali and the police are gonna hunt you down if you have some mushrooms. It's not like there's a bunch of signs saying, don't eat the mushrooms from the mushroom dealers like there are in Cambodia. It's not like in Japan where there's 28 different species of psychedelic, actually 31 different species of psilocybin mushroom that grow there and it's still taboo. You know, mushrooms weren't made illegal in certain places until 20 or 30 years ago. And so we have to keep in, into consideration 
the places that have the best mushrooms are probably the places where it's not illegal. <laughs> because those are places where the mushroom is still revered as a food as well as a psychedelic. You know, this is something that's a part of our diet. It's food of the gods. It's food for spirit. It's food that we use to speak to God. And it's the flesh of God to us. And that's how the Aztec, the Mayan descendants feel about it. It's Teotihuacan. It's the flesh of God. You eat the mushroom so that you can become deified. And deification is not like we're talking about in Buddhism or not like we're talking about in Hinduism. It is the same at the core of the highest level of realization, which is becoming one in concert with the rain, the clouds, the stones, the earth. You are literally disappearing into the matrix basically you're, you're you're going into the background you are now invisible that's what deification means is becoming teotl and total uh, or teotl is the equivalent of the indifferent genderless uh desireless and sometimes nameless monistic uh great spirit of the aztec and zapotec priests and that is something that I value very much about Aztec philosophy that is lost very much so due to a lack of study and Western voices talking about the polytheistic nature of Aztec spirituality having no concept of what actual Aztec philosophy really is. And so I say, read the book by James Maffey, Aztec Philosophy, University of Maryland. Study it because it's closer to Taoism and Buddhism but it has its own way of explaining things that is entirely unique. And I really enjoy it. Hmm. I think we we came full circle in terms of, you know, going back to that concept of the same source and many different emanations and manifestations yeah, of that so source. I, everything that I so, study goes together. <laughs> Something that you'll find out about me. I don't like confusion. Like, please don't, please do not put me in circles that are not related to each other. You know, if I talk about African studies or if I talk about Indonesian studies or if I talk about Buddhism or African studies or Christianity, I'm kind of looking at it from that zenith. <laughs> it's, it's in there somewhere. There's a, there's a parallel somewhere in there that's attracted me to it. And I've been sussing out that point where it connects up to that that one love that one source you know and um yeah i mean just what i do right i don't know nothing <laughs> how do you so. <laughs> how, how do you is there something within you that like helps you sort of go in that direction or decide where you know i like names you, you you know it's always some 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 name stuff right you know like that's gonna be shattered one day and then gonna be like you're gonna be on facebook and be like where'd your name go i'll be like i have a name for this you know like I, I i was born with one of those weird spiritual names that like a lot of people like change their names to like when they like do their research or whatever i was born with that name I was born with the name acacia so i have a weird funky spiritual name <laughs> i don't use it <laughs> because i think that stuff is silly <laughs> you know but in my trips, you know, I have had experiences where I have seen things from a different perspective. And I went to some reality. I don't know if it was the future or uh, I, I'm just going to guess. I think it was the future, but it would have to be like, I'd say a couple hundred thousand years from now or at least 20,000 years from now. Because apparently in that place that we went, um, they're pulling me out of a cryo chamber and... They gave, they, they, uh, they addressed me by my name and the name that they addressed me by was not Acacia. The name that they addressed me by was Zenith. And so I started researching that and going all crazy about it online. I was like, oh, it's a different perspective. I was like, oh, I see. That's kind of like an inside joke. That's kind of funny. <laughs> all right. And, you know, and so, you know. I didn't know that until like maybe four years ago. So a lot of what I do is, I guess you could say, just looking at things from a different perspective. And being in astrophysics, that's what they train us to do. You're supposed to think out of the box. 
you're supposed to grok it from 15 different ways till Sunday. And I wasn't a very good astrophysicist, but I can definitely grok things from weird perspectives. So, yeah. It sounds like it's working out for you, though. Yeah. Well, good. thankfully, <laughs> like now they're not calling me autistic anymore. <laughs> like, oh, yeah, we, we like it, Casey. I'm like, okay, well, I'll just keep writing over here, eating mushrooms and doing mantras. And oh, my God. Sitting cross-legged, you know what? That should be the first thing. Like, oh, how do I become more disciplined? Learn how to sit in lotus pose. You, if, if you can't do it right now and you think that you're a flexible young adult, do it. I was crying this morning. I was like, eh, I haven't done this in so long. It's been like five years since I like sat in meditation for like three hours or more. This past initiation, I sat in the very front, like one. One, one row from the front, because I don't know nothing, just sit, sit back in the front. And, you know, they got the little Zyfus and the meditation cushion. So I sat my butt on it, and I was like, oh, this isn't too bad. First hour goes by. Ooh, I feel a little twinge in my knees. Second hour goes by. Oh, my God. And, and yeah. Guru Ponche, I love him. He was, he was going in on some Tibetan mantra that was like an hour long and I was in the middle of it just tear like streaming down my eye like seeing all sorts of psychedelic wheels and stuff coming out like wow this is so interesting like I did not expect this to be a psychedelic experience I didn't take any mushrooms today okay and just watching but at the same time being in the most excruciating pain at about the third hour and as soon as he puts his hands together and says okay now I'm done. Like, oh, <laughs> put my knees out in front of me, cover myself up with a scarf, just stayed there quiet. The only buddy in the second row who who wasn't in lotus pose was me. I was like, he's done, guys. It's done now. <laughs> I can stop breaking my hips. And I was walking. The, the I was walking like a hunchback, like after. Like it was just. Even this morning, I was just. The, la the llamas are a trip because they can just speak and teach on like, like a line, you know, like, a, <laughs> we're not going to go through a book. We're not going to go through a chapter. We're just going to talk about this one line for like the no, next no, three hours, through, you know, and like break it down. He went and... through the, the whole, <laughs> but sometimes uh, praise so him and Drew Shree, he went through a mandala Kala chakra offering. And it was one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen in my life. They did a full sand mandala and everything. And so he was, uh, he, he blessed us with all the different forms, et cetera. And then when he gets to the end, he's like, oh, I'm going to do the traditional mandala offering, the long, the long one. And then he goes, and I didn't understand any of the words in Tibetan, like in the English language, but I could see the words. Like when he would speak, you know that, uh, I don't even know what to call it yet because I'm, I'm young and I'm dumb. And it looks like a wheel that has these different spinning uh, like pedals in the middle of it. And it swirls. I think, I think it's one of the Dharma wheels. It might be on the Wheel of Life mandala. Um, but yeah, I saw that and it was like the sound of his voice. I could hear like singing in the background, like Tibetan throat singing in the background. And then see this mandala kind of being created as he was speaking these things and that's one of the things where it's like people people think that you you need to be on something per se or on a psychedelic to have a spiritual experience i'm like no you just might need to be initiated before they show you that kind of stuff first because looking at it from the outside mm -hmm. you're thinking it's this but it's really completely you know it came from an entheogenic right. context, but to protect the sanctity of the system, it's not permitted for outsiders to really just see or talk about, you know? Yeah. And in Tibetan Buddhism, especially like uh, there's so many different layers and sort of rabbit holes that you can go down in terms of the complexity of it. Kalindi, Kalindi started this for me because <laughs> he showed the Kala Chakra, um, he showed the call track or seed syllable, syllable and I looked at it and I was like, okay, that's interesting. And then he showed the sand mandala and then he three dimensionalized and he said, this is what it looks like on mushrooms. And I said, okay, sure, whatever. And I remember I tried this in 2018 
this is when the year that my wife converted officially to like Buddhism is when we start reading the old sutras and working with the psilocybin mushroom. And she said, I think I met the medicine Buddha. And I'm like, what? What do you mean? She's like, I think, like, I just saw it. I saw it in me. I'm like, really? She was like, yeah. And then she started doing the mantra and then all these little tiny, like, blue particles start manifesting into the space. It was the most beautiful thing I'd ever seen before. And between her... And then Kalindi, like, that's what really got me into studying this as part of my own path. Um, But it's not singular. I'm coming at it from seven or eight different directions. You know, I I still am a Lakota pipe carrier. I still sing Lakota medicine songs. I still play a flute. I still beat a drum. I still have hawk's feathers on my altar, you know. And this is a part of my blood tradition. But it all connects. It all, it all connects seamlessly into my practice. But the, 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 the biggest takeaway, the biggest takeaway for me out of this whole experience like this past week is tea ceremony, working with the signature of specific Camellia sinensis plants or green tea plants that were collected by hand in a specific mountain uh, on specific rocks that were around at the turn of the advent of Buddhism and the advent of Confucianism and Taoism, there is something ancient and relevant about the quantum entanglement of these plants that are still growing in these areas that are like 2,000 years old, that have sacred information inside of them, that when you start implementing that into your, into your physical body, it starts changing you. Like, I, the transformation I've gone through in the last week has been bizarre. Like, you could probably ask my partner. I went and I raided Ikea for every home organizational supply that they freaking had. Like, I bought every weird name. I bought a Scooby-Doo. I bought a a freaking Scalb, a Puda, you know, like, these weird name things. But they're great because you can spend, like, 40 bucks and then get your whole life in order, so to speak, all of your physical belongings. And flavors are weird now. You know, like after your first mushroom trip, things taste different. After your first ayahuasca trip, things taste different. After your first Diana, things taste different. After your Buddhist initiation, everything that you thought you knew about plant medicine and and bacteria in your mouth and whatnot goes out the window. I went to have, you know, my potato and egg breakfast. You know, it's it's okay. You know, the mushrooms made it okay for me. No, it's not okay anymore. The grease in it, it just, it killed me. I had a bowl of the most plain rice and it had such beautiful flavor compounds in it. Like something about what happened to me changed my taste buds. So now even the most bland foods taste really, really freaking good. And as a result, tea is like going to Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory and going to the machine where you press Thanksgiving dinner and they give you like a little berry and you put it in your mouth and now you can taste the whole Thanksgiving dinner, that's what tea is like. I have one tea called Golden Goddess, another called Amber Orchid, one called Pole Star, and then I I like to get one from the shop called Everlasting Happiness. And each one is a different trip. And it's just that level of sensitivity. Most people don't have that level of sensitivity, and they also don't know how to brew it at the right temperature and for the right time and how to also respect the plant and then brew it in the technology of the Zisha pot or the purple clay pot that has certain minerals in it that affect the flavor and make it taste better. People don't understand that these tools aren't accessories. They're really part of the ceremonial or traditional aspect of the ritual of drinking tea, you know, and that's something that's simpler than most rituals that you can get into fairly affordably. That has been a profound blessing in my experience in my existence, you know? Um, so yeah. Awesome. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, that's, I think we came full circle on that as well. You know, the, how getting, getting more sensitive, getting more in tune to your experience, whether that's with medicine or with tea or with food. Um, it's something I don't think I didn't know that it was going to happen to me. You know, like I thought like, Oh, I'm just going to keep, taking more medicine and more mushrooms the longer I go. And it's like, no, actually it's going to be exactly the opposite. You're going to start 
cutting back, you're going to start getting the same experience or a deeper experience with, with less, you know, like, and there's a, there's a certain sense of, it happens. Yeah. Over there's 10 a years. certain sensitivity, like you're saying, and, you know, all of a sudden you're like, oh, I can't eat this anymore. You'll work your way all the way back <laughs> down and you eat one gram and you have a 20 gram <laughs> trip. Well, then that's when you have to say, OK, I still don't know shit. Let me take five grams again. Once you work your way all the way down, work your way all the way back up, then work your way all the way down. Then take two years off then do it again. And you tell me how you feel. <laughs> it's going to get more profound every time you work all the way down to like the point, point one, point two, point zero zero one. You could just take a little bit, then you just hold the mushroom and then wait like six months and then actually take five grams if you want to do it that way. I call that apprenticeship. If you really want to apprentice under something, you don't just go all the way up and say that she did it. You go up and then once you get up there, your sensitivity to point one starts there. And then you go up again and then you come back down and then you find the, the the practice dose and you take like a year or two off and do practice in solitude then have an experience with something like zapotec corm in oaxaca where it's really connected to the land and to the people and then eat it in a village like that thinking only about others in the village really take care of the guy who owns the pizza shop say some prayers for the lady who's making your tea connect to the community of the indigenous people who are protectors of the mushroom then come back to the united states and do the same thing in your own community connect to everybody in your community, help them out with their individual needs, wants, desires, where you fit in, and then do that in the world stage space if you are called to do so, or just stay in your community and be a vessel of healing. That's something that, that's what my mission is right now. That's what I did doing, figuring out. Beautiful. Uh -huh. so. I think that's a good place to... Uh to wrap it up for today what do you think i would have fun talking <laughs> believe me i have such a such a good time i would just call you but then you would say we should have made a podcast and i'd be I like know, yeah I, we there, there are podcast. there are some people <laughs> that i am blessed to know that are like that where it's like man like i wish we were recording this conversation right now because this is a, this is good stuff yeah. so if um for yeah. people that want to get to know you more or learn more about you, where, where should they go? How can they do that? I've become a more in-person person because of COVID and the whole Zoom meetings. I used to have a school. I still do a Divine Master Alchemy. I don't teach online anymore because these things are really hard to grasp without being in person. Um, and even more so long distance and trying to live a whole life. So don't ask about the classes unless you want to do stuff in person, but I'm in the Bay Area and you can reach me on Instagram or via text message for those who are really low tech. Um, I'll send you my number if someone asks how they can contact me. Um, and then also Acacia underscore Lewis on Instagram. It has been a pleasure once again. I'm looking forward to the next time we get to chat and really appreciate you sharing your, your knowledge, your wisdom, your understanding, and just your perspective. It's uh, just lovely. Really appreciate it. Thank you. And yeah. if you've enjoyed this podcast, and I know you have because I've been enjoying the heck out of it. Um, don't forget to subscribe, leave a review, uh, follow Acacia on Instagram. And don't forget that regardless of what modality or practice you're called to, the vital point is to practice it. You know, we don't get um, knowledge just from looking at the book. You got to read it. You got to meditate on it. You got to contemplate it and talk about it with uh, teachers and people that know a little bit about it. And that's how we keep it going. So whatever, whatever you're doing, whether it's meditation, plant medicine, breath work, tea ceremonies, don't forget to practice. That's the vital point. Sufism. That's right. You know, something I like to talk about maybe next time is uh, words, or diff different systems and traditions of dispelling wisdom, whether that's like Sufism just came to mind <clears throat> as well. So maybe we'll talk about that another time. All right. You heard it here first. Part three coming soon. All right. Thanks, everyone. We'll see you next time. Yeah, cool.